sea atmosphere. And yes, it does look round when you're up there. We'll get to that uh, a little bit later. And there's the James Webb Space Telescope not drawn to scale. Um, so I will have to do this here while we uh, um, speak. And so the topics of today are the best of Hubble, the most recent results from the uh, most recent camera that was put in, the Whitefield Camera 3, uh, installed by the astronauts in May of 2009. And then I try to use colors as consistent as possible. When, and when I use um, um, blue or purple, I'll talk about Hubble. And when I use orange, I'll talk about James Webb. So that's on purpose, because Hubble operates in the ultraviolet blue, and then James Webb operates in the red or near infrared. So we'll talk about star birth and exoplanets. We'll talk about galaxy assembly and supermassive black hole growth, what Hubble has done. And then four and five, how James Webb will pick up from here. First of all, what it is in detail. Not too much detail. I don't want you to fall asleep like I almost did. But, um, and then we'll talk about how the Webb telescope will measure the epochs of first light and reionization. And I'll give you some conclusions. So a warning, especially to the kids in the audience. Don't do this at home. But if you ask NASA for data, you get a lot. Right. <laughs> so certainly don't do that. This, this kid was careful. He was not. Yeah. So don't drown. Uh, by the way, uh, Gary Wilger, Professor Wilger, will have the uh, website where all these talks are. There's a link at the end, but he can email that around to the audience, and uh, we can write it on a whiteboard in the, in the front um, on the way out. So Mr. Hubble, um, not Hubble the telescope, but Hubble astronomer who was living here as a student and one of the folks in the audience lives in his house. That's you, right? I can't quite see it in the dark. Oh, you live there, right? It's in 1318 South somewhere. And, up when he moved in. Yeah, Mr. Hubble lived there. And so the telescope is named after him. He discovered the expansion of the universe late 1920s. Other people thinking about that, like George Lemaitre, but he actually provided measurements to publish. And so the Hubble the telescope, which was built in the 70s, was, uh, you know, we conceived in the 70s, made in the 80s, not launched until 1990, and still operating, probably operate till later this decade, um, is named after him. Uh, Mr. Webb, who the James Webb Space Telescope, the sequel to Hubble, is named after was the second NASA administrator, the one who brought us to the moon under JFK. And the story goes roughly as following. I can't quite repeat it out loud. The congressional tapes of the White House conversation were released a number of years ago. Mr. Kennedy said, I want to go to the moon. And he used a four letter word, you can't repeat it, but he didn't really care about going to the moon. He just wanted to beat the Russians. And then Mr. Webb said, No, Mr. President, if we go to the moon, we want to go out find what's there and learn about our origin. So he invented space science. That's why I'm here today. That's why most of us are here today. So it's after Mr. Webb that the um, um, uh, Webb telescope is being named. And so that was um, conceived in the late 90s, and it will be launched in 19, uh, 2018, and then will operate for at least five years. We have propellant on board for at least 11 years. So these are 30, 40 year projects from conception to finish, right? So before you know it, you'll grow old in these projects. I feel like I'm getting old. I was young when Hubble started. Uh, and with James Webb, it will be just like it, like Garfield here. You feel wrinkled when it's all said and done. Um, so especially a message to the younger generation, please join the club and start thinking about what comes after uh, Hubble and James Webb. So the James Webb, the JWST as we call it, is two and a half times larger in diameter than Hubble. And so at two and a half times longer wavelengths, it will give you exactly the same resolution, the fine, same images. And at uh, shorter wavelengths, or uh, it would do better when you go uh, to the same wavelengths as Hubble, there will be some wavelengths of overlap in the red. There, James Webb will be at least two and a half or three times better than uh, the Hubble telescope. Yeah, and it's both mirrors are obviously much bigger than the size of a human being. Now, when these telescopes like Hubble are, of course, also Webb, when they get made, Hubble was made 
to be serviced on purpose by the astronauts, which was just as good because it didn't work so well the first few years the astronauts had to go out and fix it. And all these instruments that were installed by the astronauts in Hubble were tested many times by the astronauts in a help crew. This is not a real instrument, of course. This is in a giant pool in, in, in Johnson Space Flight Center where they sort of simulate zero gravity. And they tried to put the instrument in a mock-up of Hubble. It's not a real instrument. We tried to keep that dry. But in any case, it's a very accurately made mock-up of the instrument, very accurately made mock-up of Hubble, just to make sure everything fits. That's terribly important, because you don't want to come out there and find out it doesn't fit. So here's the real thing, where the astronauts take out the old camera, in this case, the Whitefield camera 2, and then at the end of the robotic arm puts the new camera in, which is temporarily stored in the bay of the space shuttle, which is at the bottom so it's towards you. And here's the Hubble captured um, at the end of the shuttle at bay after the doors open. By the way, this is the Earth. You can see it's round. Um, in case there was any doubt. I know you didn't doubt that. But, oh, by the way, you even know, you know it's, it's really traumatic. I mean, I've never been in space, but to be an astronaut in space, you know, we, we need to wake up in the morning and then see sunset in the evening. They get 16 sunrises and sunsets a day, right? That's pretty, pretty traumatic, 48 minute orbit, 15 to 16 sunrises and sunsets. So it's also hard on the telescope, as we'll find out. And, and once you're that far up above the Earth, 360 nautical miles, the horizon isn't there, but it's 24 degrees down. So it really looks like a sphere that's way below you. Um, you're that far up, really. So here's the good old Whitefield Camera uh, 3, when it, uh, just before it went in, uh, was launched, uh, with the technicians uh, testing it out in, in the chamber before it uh, goes into the shuttle. Here's the outer shield that makes with the Hubble. And um, I've actually looked at that outer shield. It's about the size of this table. And it's been in space already. It was launched with the original Hubble as the Whitefield Camera 1 from, from April 1990. Then it came out in December of 93. So it was in space for three and a half years. And the outer titanium shield has all these little pock marks of micrometeorites that hit it over three and a half years. Not that many, and they didn't go through. They were very tiny, but they still hit at high speed. And, and so you need to all worry about that when you design this giant sun shield. Uh, for James Webb, that they will get hit by micrometeorites and that it's allowed to do that. So let's get to the second part of the talk, the actual measurements of star birth and Earth-like exoplanets. So this is one of the more beautiful images that the Hubble Whitefield Camera 3 took. And let me see a raise of hands here. How many of you actually go to school here uh, at the university? Yeah? And, and how many of you go to the local high schools? Uh, there's a few children here, local schools, a few children here in the audience too. Yeah, I see some raised hands, that's good. Well, okay, so we have here a cluster of hot stars. I hope I don't offend any of the college students on campus. I have a special name for them. These are young hot stars. They, they live very short, they're very hot, they're much more massive than the sun. And I call them the cosmic fraternity members. <laughs> and, and the reason is they, they live fast and they die young. Uh, don't do this at home, please. And, and so these are stars that are maybe five or ten times more massive than the sun. And they burn up their hydrogen very quickly. And then in a few million years, they go boom. We don't do that. Our sun lives for already four and a half billion years. It probably got at least as long to go. Why is that important? Well, these, these hot, young, massive stars go off. For, you know, they basically start burning first. And they shape the surrounding material. So here you see what we call a pillar of gas. Some people call it pillars of creation. And the top of this gaseous cloud is very much illuminated by the ultraviolet radiation from these cosmic fraternity members. So it is these hot young stars that die first that give rise to the new stars that are being formed here in these pillars of creation. That happens very commonly. In fact, it not only happens in our own galaxy, but it happens in other galaxies as well. And it's right here at the end of these shock fronts that stars like the sun are formed. Here you can see the same process, but this is now not in our galaxy, this is in the Magellanic Cloud, also seen by Hubble Whitefield Camera 3. And this is a good example of what Webb will see compared to Hubble. Here's the ultraviolet image with a little bit of red superimposed. There's the cluster of cosmic fraternity members. In fact, the biggest one we know of is called 30 Doradus, a giant star cluster about 150 light years away. And 
Uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but on top here is a little finger. It's a pillar of creation that's uh, very much, it looks like a finger like this. It's contrasted in the optical. And then it shines through a little better here in the infrared. So this is the same field. You can see the same finger in the infrared. Now I'm going to show you the same optical and infrared images to show you what you can gain when you can go from the optical to the infrared at higher resolution. There's that finger. And in the optical, you see nothing, except you know that this giant cluster is here shaping this column of gas. But if you now go to the infrared, you suddenly see a star like the sun that's forming there. So in this pillar of gas, stars are like the sun are forming. So because these cosmic fraternity members you know, live fast, they die young, they, they actually allow other stars like the sun to form later. And that's how cosmic star formation takes place. And this happens everywhere, right? Here's another example, for instance, of, of the um, 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 formation of a star in the optical ultraviolet compared to the infrared, where this whole gas column is much more transparent. This looks like a giant chimney smokestack and this is kind of the same thing. And now in the infrared, where the wavelength is much longer, you can actually see in the center of the smoke, smokestack, that will be about here, there is actually a star forming that is squirting out two jets in roughly horizontal direction. And that's, again, where another star uh, like the sun is forming. We call that herbic haro objects. And, and James Webb will do the same thing. It will take these optical Hubble, Hubble images and look much further in the infrared through the smoke and dust and find where these young stars are forming. Again, this dramatic shape is caused by all these hot young stars that are, in this case, above the picture and shaping the surrounding environment. So that's where we come from. So here's another topic. Um, um, not unlike one of the students, is, is Jeremy Hornbeck here is working on um, uh, images um, of a star, and we'll show you some other examples in a minute. 